Three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Sober Gang Experience Podcast with Mr. Showout TV. It's great to have you here with us today. I hope this podcast provides you with the inspiration to continue your journey towards a sober lifestyle. Please click the like and subscribe button before you start watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. I'm so excited about today's show. I got a very special guest in the building. She will be sharing with us everything she went through in addiction and how she is turning her life around today. But this is what I need from you all. This is very important. Since you're here and since you're in the building with me today, I would love for you, and I really need you to hit that like button as soon as you come through the door. When you hit the like button, you are actually letting YouTube know how important our videos are. Let's, let's hit the algorithm. Let's make the algorithm see more of our videos. And also, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Hey, this is one of the most lit shows on YouTube, and, and I can admit to it. I know it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. But look, look, look. We also like to inspire people in addiction. We like to have fun. So I would love for you guys just to go and get your popcorn ready because I got a great speaker in the building. So let's get right to it, everybody. Hey, Miss Layla, how you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing so fine. I'm doing so fine. It's a lovely Tuesday. And so, you know, we up, we up. So we're going to try to inspire some people. Yeah. So uh, can you good. tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, um, my name is, my name is actually Mary. It's Layla on the thing, but whatever. So my name is Mary. Um, I'm 40 years old. Um, I spent like over 20 years in active addiction. Um, didn't think there was any hope. Uh, I currently, I changed my people, places and things. I'm currently in Florida and I'll have a year clean next month. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's take it back. Let's take it back a little bit. Uh, <coughs> what was your upbringing like? Oh, my upbringing. Um, my family was very much there, but not there. Like I, I never really felt seen. So that started off very, very young. Um, I don't have a lot of memories of my parents being around. They were also involved in active addiction when I was a child. So I was at a lot of friends' houses all the time, you know, which just led to or very early feelings of like a abandonment um, and just not feeling seen and not just not feeling loved, even though I was told. So I automatically had a disconnect at a very young age, you know? Yeah, um, yeah and then so at like three years old, I was um, being abused by somebody in the day, the preschool center I was at. And then, so, and then they, they did something about that, right? So that person got caught. But then later on at like seven, um, I ended up being abused for like three years off and on um, by a friend of the family in a very bad way and nobody ever like I remember telling my mom about it but she was too high or drunk at the time to do anything so that just kind of furthered uh, not trusting anybody or anything you know what I mean it's like feeling disconnected so the pain and fear right because our disease is about self-centered fear and like it's a thousand different forms of fear so that was instilled very early yeah yeah so did you have any like you also said that you just really didn't have any family background to bag you up I guess, you know, uh, you pretty much you have to take that all in for yourself, right? Had to yeah, I had a brother, right? But he was, I don't, I don't think this has anything to do with it, him being six years older than me, but it just seemed, it just felt like I was in this box and my family, you know, and a normal world was just outside of it. And I just felt very much alone. I mean, I spent a lot of time in my imagination because I had to, you know what I mean? So I was already very much disconnected with reality. Right. So that pretty much led, that was pretty much the, like the underlying factor. Um, let's yeah. let's get, get yeah. on this subject. Being homeless for six months in Orlando, how did that say? Yeah. How did that say? Uh, it gave me the gift of desperation. Um, I had already lost everything else. Um, it's funny 
you know, how our rock bottoms end up happening. Um, both my parents had already passed from cancer. My brother had already taken care of, like, custody of my daughter to take care of her. Um, so I, I already had nothing. And I actually chose being homeless. It's not like I, like, I could have stayed in my stepfather's house, but that was a bad situation, too, because I was being exploited. Um, so I chose to go be homeless for six months because in my mind, it would have been easier to get my drug of choice, right? And I was like, I'll have no other responsibilities. But while I was there, uh, I can remember it was like the six scariest months of my life. I knew that I was going to die. I knew that I was going to die if I stayed out there, whether I got killed, you know, from somebody, another person living homeless there, or really it was just, I was so miserable. I was going to keep using to the point where I overdosed again and I wasn't going to wake up. Um, and that led me, it drove me after six months. I remember waking up one day and I was like, I can't, my inner child, I think, was finally like, I cannot do this anymore. So I got a ride back to where I was living before and I ended up getting a call from a treatment center and like a, a good one. Like I always went to um, detox, right? But this was an actual treatment center. So I flew out there. Um, and yeah, it took another time going back to the treatment center because I was still stubborn. I ended up getting on maintenance meds because I was just, I hadn't surrendered yet, you know. But this second time, um, this second time when I went back, I surrendered. I came off of the taper with Suboxone. Um, I, I felt my consequences because I was in withdrawal the entire time I was in treatment. Right. Um, but I needed that. I needed to feel that so I could remember the cause. You have to feel your consequences. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah we, we, yeah, we all go through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely did. Um, but it was what I needed. It was the catalyst, uh, that, that pain of going through withdrawal. Like they say that when the pain of remaining the same outweighs your fear of change mm -hmm. is when you'll surrender. And that is definitely, that's definitely when I surrendered. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a story. I'm going to piggyback off of what you said, because at one point when I had to have emergency surgery, Layla, and <clears> you know, at that point it was like, uh, it, what you want to do with yourself? You want to die doing this shit? Or do you just want to just, it, it's time for a change. And at that moment, I knew it was time for a change later. I mean, sometimes, like you said, it take us to hit rock, rock bottom for yeah. us to realize, for some of us to realize that we need change. Oh, um, I have- In rock, mm -hmm. go ahead, I'm sorry. No, you can go, you can go. I was just gonna say like, in my rock bottom still, I don't even think it was homeless in Orlando. Like it sounds like that should be my rock bottom, but it really wasn't. It was that second time in treatment. Um, and I got a temporary sponsor. That was the first step I made that was different. I got a temporary sponsor. I didn't let my ego talk me out of it. And um, I remember laying in the bed up in detox thinking, I am all out of ideas. I literally, I've tried maintenance. I've tried holding on to getting high in, in, in a legal form with maintenance. Nothing else is working. And so I was in my head and I called my temporary sponsor and I was thinking about my past abuser that had me sex trafficked, you know, out of my daughter's bedroom while my daughter was sleeping in a different room, all that. I couldn't get out of my head. She said, I want you to hang up the phone and go ask other every other female in that facility how they're doing without sharing about yourself that second part was really hard so but in doing that it got me out of my head and i was like hope oh my god there's hope because i was getting ready to leave and go use again i really was but in the effort it took me to ask another human being how they were doing without sharing about myself and being like oh well i um, was my first, you know, glimpse of hope. It was my first, I do not have to live like this anymore because I wasn't thinking about using while I was trying so hard not to share about myself. Right, right. I understand. You know? That. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we learn by fault sometimes. There's a lot of things and when we in our addiction, we learn by fault. We learn by trial and error also. So, yeah. You know, I'm so proud it's of hard. you. It, it's hard. Thank very, you. <laughs> it, yeah. It's very hard. Um, Cause we always know that that demon's right around the corner at any moment. You know, it's yep. the pressure's <laughs> there. The pressure's always there. So we just got to keep over pushing, pushing. I, I hear a lot. No, sure, please go ahead and ask. Cause I, I talk a lot. So <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. I love this. <laughs> this, this dialogue. I love dialogue like this. It's back and forth. You know, it gives cool. a lot of people something they can they can you know relate to as well. So. Okay, definitely. Uh, Okay, the next question, <laughs> next question. When did you realize you had a problem? Hmm. Um, I mean, so out of 20 years of active addiction, I don't, 
I don't really remember. That's how deep I, so somewhere in the middle, like somewhere when if I had to go without the opiate, cause I, and I hope that's okay to say on here, but like opiates were my drug of choice. And the first time I had to go without them and I was sick, I was like, it was the tiniest little flicker of like, you know, this might suck. <laughs> this might be a problem. I might need to do something different, but that was it. It was a fleeting thought and it was gone cause it was completely overtaken by how can I get more? How can I make sure that I have it every single day and immediately becoming willing to do anything to get it, including exploiting myself sexually, which I'm not proud of, but I feel like somebody on here might need to hear that. Somebody on here might need to hear like you, you you're not a bad person. You're not a, a disgusting person. Like those were behaviors you were doing in survival mode, you know? Yeah, so, I, yeah. That was a lot of, you know, when you in survival mode, you're absolutely right. Cause I have a lot of, of women guest speakers on here and they also speak up on that. When you're in survival mode, um, it's pretty much you will do anything to get it, you know. Yeah, and, and you'll so allow anything to happen to you as well. You'll allow the boundaries to be crossed. Um, like, I literally would allow anything to happen. I'm just going to get really real here for a second. Like, the things I was doing to get my money, I was doing for $20 or less at a time. Right. Like, that... And, and me knowing how I am today, I, I would never, and I had, I had no self, I didn't know my self worth, you know, all I cared about was getting high to the point where I was exploiting myself for $20 or less, like, that's crazy. But you know, you know? at that moment, we don't, we, 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 we're not thinking. No. You know, we, mm -hmm. we be so beyond ourselves at that moment, because at that moment, only thing you know is how to get it. And you yeah. know what you got and what you can use to get it. Yeah, and, and and the people who got it, the, the, the who selling it to you, they also go take advantage of it. They go run with it as well. So, yeah, and that's a hard pill to swallow too. I was yeah, doing yeah. A, my my fourth step, and it was uh, trying to take and having to take responsibility for certain things that I just wanted to play a victim in. Sometimes, you know what I mean. Um, and don't get me wrong, there were there were times like when I was raped and my active addiction and things like that. Like that's not my fault. But there are other times that I'm speaking of where I willingly participated in certain things that weren't good for me just just because I didn't want to be sick and I could not meet life on life's terms. I just could not. Understandable. Understandable. But you're doing an awesome job right now and it's, you take a lot of courage for you to come up here and speak up on this because I know one thing's for sure that somebody will watch this and get something out of it. So I, I hope so. You. <laughs> I congratulate you. Thanks. Okay. What was do you remember the underlying factor? You know, um, what was the underlying factor that really led you to everything? Was it the physical and sexual abuse or I think it's a little of everything. I, I'm one of those people that believes I was born with this disease, right? Um, and it was, there were catalysts along the way, but definitely having been abused physically at three years old and then sexually from the ages of seven to 10 and then having the family completely sweep it under the rug. So immediately fear. When I, when I, the more step work I do, man, the more I realize everything was because of the fear I had. I was afraid of everything. And, um, but the sexual abuse didn't help. You know what I mean? Having your family not acknowledge that didn't help. So it was pain and not knowing how to handle my emotions. So I did any and everything to escape them. But yeah, definitely fear and pain. Wow. Wow. Okay. Did your incarceration help you at all? Yes. I know you, I know you about things, Doctor. Did that did that help your addiction? Did it help you get wing you off of it for a little while? Because you know a lot of people yeah. when they go in there and you know they kinda they kinda get sobered up. But you know, sometimes yeah. you can go in there and get just as high as you was on the street. So how did that uh, I did not have the experience of being able to go in there and get uh, high as so hell. Thank God, I'm saying. Like everyone, I remember thinking while I was in jail too, I was I was thinking, I mean, everybody around me seems to be coming in with stuff. Why can't I? Well, I'm glad I didn't because um, it broke the spell. The first time I was um, in jail was for, well, I was probably for two weeks, but because I was sick, uh, it was like forever. But that was the first breaking of the spell because I had, been clean like a full day or so I think in almost 20 years maybe a day being sick but you know what I'm saying like I hadn't really broken this spell um the entire time so the first time I was in jail was definitely it definitely helped what really helped me was when I got arrested the 12th time <laughs> the 12th time and um I waived a bond hearing and chose to sit in jail for three months to wait for a department of corrections rehab that got the spell broken long enough to get the seed of like a foundation for recovery in there. And then I spent six months in the Department of Corrections Rehab. 
So so you basically winged yourself off with it a little bit, huh? In jail, yeah. <laughs> you know, some, some people say sometimes going to jail is a good thing. You know, because yeah. jail, jail really do save people's lives. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it, but I believe it did. Yeah, it <laughs> I is, do believe it know, did. Like the old saying goes, sad but true. But that is a real, just uh, when you think about it, because some people can go to jail at the right time. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes when you behind them walls and you locked up for five to six months on the time, only thing you can do is think. Yeah, you definitely. Think. I was also uh, bedridden for whatever reason. Uh, one of the one of those last times I got arrested, I don't know. One of my car accidents and the pain from that, I, I was starting to be able to feel it through through my using. So I knew it was intense. And once I was in jail and had no more dope, I literally could not get out of bed. Those those out of those three months, the first month and a half to two months I was there, I couldn't get up in line for chow. I couldn't. I could barely go to the bathroom. So I was. My higher power had me laying there in a bunk in jail sitting and thinking about how I didn't want to do this anymore and I needed that I was because I died man like four times like four times and I was trying to kill myself but not in the way that most people would think like I wasn't using a gun I just remember using more and more I was an IV user so I remember making each one stronger and stronger and stronger you know what I mean so I needed jail weird to say that but I needed jail but actually you know that's a blessing in disguise because, like you said, it actually helped you. So that was, yeah. that was a blessing. That was a blessing. Yeah. I got another question for you. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about mental health in addiction? Because you know, mental health is a big issue. It's a stigma in the communities where people don't want to just say that they need help. So, what are your thoughts about the mental health in addiction? Um, I think a lot of people suffering with um, the disease of addiction, because um, that in itself is a disease of the mind. So I feel like a lot of us are under that dual diagnosis where you might have um, other issues going on, but and that requires a different level of care. Um, but for most of us, even being through trauma, like I've been through trauma, um, is when it came to addiction, for me anyway, like I can't speak on anybody else, but for me, it wasn't my mental health that stopped me from asking for help. It was my ego. It was me. It was my ego, um, not wanting to surrender and not all of that, because that's for me anyway, that's what it was. But for the people with serious mental health issues, also suffering from addiction, that's a complicated issue. You know what I mean? And only doctors, I feel like, can help you with that. Not with narcotics, though. <laughs> I'm just, right. I'm just saying, because I just, I have ADHD too, right? So they, I could technically go and be qualified to be put on what is it like Vyvanse or Adderall? But like, what we're not going to do with someone in recovery is put them on a narcotic medication, right, right, and right. expect them to be able to handle it. So right. I don't take anything. I don't take anything for it. So it can be done. <laughs> How did you cope? with your physical and sexual abuse, you know, did you get any counseling from it? Did you seek therapy or you just, how did you manage to cope with it? With all the pressure uh, and I didn't, I didn't, if and I'm being honest, the only thing I was doing that I thought was coping with it was I became very promiscuous, right? Cause they tried to put me in therapy for it, but here's the thing about that, like you, until you're ready, for therapy, it's not gonna help. I sat in a therapist's office on and off for a year during my parents' divorce battle and never once talked about it. And I internalized it. I ended up uh, becoming very promiscuous because, and this is another thing my fourth step helped me with. I started, uh, since, since sex was introduced to me as a weapon at a very early age, I tried to use it myself to protect myself. And I thought that by becoming very promiscuous, um, that that would somehow shield me from, I don't know, being taken advantage of again but in reality I did it to myself and became my own abuser but nowadays nowadays the steps I will tell you the only thing as far as helping me cope with being sexually abused uh, being sexually trafficked all those things are the steps I have regular therapy didn't do it didn't cut it for me um, but the steps did um, the higher power thing what working the steps having a sponsor working the program that's how I continue to cope today yeah, yeah, that is a very, very, uh, and for anybody out there that's listening right now, doing the steps is very, very important and having a sponsor as well, because you do not have all the answers. We do not have all the answers later. Sometimes we just, no. you know, we could be all over the place sometimes and, you know, and doing the steps and working the steps, that is what they're there for. Because, you know, I believe in working the steps also, but I also believe, here's my thing about the steps. 
is uh, I believe in my higher power. Uh, I put I put him first, and yep. you know, yeah, I put I put my higher power first, and then I work the steps, you know. So, but they also go hand in hand. Yeah, definitely. That's, I mean, so step one is like admitting, admitting, wow, that's a whole new word I just made up live. Okay. okay. Anyway, admitting your powerlessness, right? And then coming to believe that a power grid, that's why they're in order because you've got to have the higher power first. If, if drugs and, um, if drugs and alcohol are cunning, baffling and powerful, and then we're admitting our powerlessness in the first step, you've got to have a power stronger than addiction to put in place before that. Definitely. I agree. Mm-hmm. So let's take it back a little bit. Uh, bounce off when you were saying when you were talking about being trafficked. Uh, okay. Were you were you were you using was were they using the the drugs to manipulate your mind and control you at the time? So yeah, I mean, I was already an IV drug user, and my um, husband at the time, you know, we were both using IV, and we would have friends over from time to time. But this one particular night was very strange. Um, I don't I just remember just feeling it was strange but because I wanted to use it I just went ahead and kept you know using um but they put see we were using meth and heroin IV something was different about that night and I remember after having done one um I started to feel very different and it was very very much like MDMA but because that was the one thing my husband at the time knew I didn't have a tolerance to I found out later it was GHB okay it was liquid GHB that they switched out in my in what I was doing so my consciousness got very fuzzy but I kept waking up kind of like in the middle of everything and I would wake up in my daughter's room and the light would either be on or off and I was I was completely completely naked and I was being set back down and picked back up and somebody was coming out of a closet I found out later it was all recorded I don't know where it is on the dark web I'm sure it's out there somewhere um and then I, I woke up one of the last times to find my husband at the time sitting in the corner like he had been watching. I also had bruises on my thighs. It was, it was, and, and to top all that off because I was still so out of it the next morning, um, he tried to pretend like it never happened. He admitted to me when I woke up that last time too, by the way, that, um, I woke up and I was looking at him across the room kind of trying to figure out what was going on and he looked at me and said you know you had sex with two guys tonight right it's almost as if he could tell that they hadn't been able to keep me out right. and was trying to cover his tracks um but you know your soul knows like I remember enough to know what happened and when I did finally remember I still stayed <laughs> in that relationship because because of my active addiction for like eight more years um god yeah but yeah, so using definitely put me in that uh, in that situation. You know, sometimes when we're in a situation like that, you know, I, we stick around because I guess we feel loved. I guess, you know, that's I think it's we, the pain is familiar. I think that yeah. chaos and pain is, is familiar to us. So we accept it. Yeah, we accept it. That's a good one right there. You show absolutely right on that. Let's yeah. get to the next one. OK. OK. Finish this sentence for me, Miss Layla. Finish this sentence. My name is Layla. And I am grateful. <laughs> Great. I am grateful. Yeah, definitely. That I don't have to live like that anymore. That I know who I am today. Great answer. Great answer. And like I said, I'm enjoying having this conversation with you. Thank you. <laughs> me too. Tuning in with me. Thank you. I Thank you for know. having me. Okay, no, I'm ready. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Who is Layla? Who is Miss Layla? Today, Layla is. Uh, it's weird to talk about myself in third person. Hey guys, and Layla, <laughs> Layla is a woman who is not afraid to show the depth of her scars in hopes that it will save someone else and show, not to save, but to show someone else the way out of hell, that there is a way out. You don't have to stay there anymore. There is a way and there's hope. Wow. Okay. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Another question. I know I'm getting off topic right now. That's okay. But, uh, did you ever feel like giving up? Because, you know, for, for some of the people, for some of the women, that is in jail right now going going through battles doing doing time in, in corrections uh, did you ever feel like giving up absolutely i mean absolutely in many many ways um there's still times i feel like well, i'm just going to be real there's times on my recovery journey almost a year in that i feel like giving up because life is life on life's terms is hard bro um, the difference is today, I think when I feel like giving up, I know what to do. I know to call my sponsor. I know to either do that or um, get into my step work or sometimes just go see if I can be of service to somebody else. 
you know, that's what I was taught that first time I got a glimpse of hope I was telling you about when she said to ask other people how they're doing. But yeah, I definitely felt like giving up. And in jail, oh my God, all I wanted was to be able to get out so I could get high or just give up. I didn't want to live plenty of times because just the pain of active addiction is so hard. It is so hard, especially when you don't know of a way out and can't see any other way. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And like I love to say, I'm just so proud of you right now. Uh, keep Thank your you. head up. Keep your head up, Layla, because right now you are on the right track. And Thanks. Hey, what we doing right here, if this episode can inspire one person, Miss Layla, we doing our job. That's right. That's why, that's why I job. wanted to do it. Thank you so yeah. much. I got, You're I got another question for okay. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Finish this sentence. Today I will not give up. <laughs> oh, great. Great. Yeah. great. Today I will not give up. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so emotions are really hard for me, right? Like any time I feel an emotion, I mean, even happiness sometimes, because I want to celebrate that by, you know, getting high, right? But no. So today I will not try to control things that are out of my control. And the only thing I can control is how I react, you know? Awesome, awesome. You guys know the serenity prayer, right? Yeah, I got a tattoo it on me right here. Okay, so I that's awesome. Um, in treatment this last time, someone, one of the facilitators there had a different version of the serenity prayer and it really resonated with me. And it was like this, it was like, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is everything in the world. The courage to change the thing I can, which is me and the wisdom to remember that it's always me only that I can change, you know? I love that. That was like, <laughs> I heard that and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, opened, that opened you up to a whole new reality. Yeah, new level unlocked. <laughs> I love that, I love that, I love that. That I was good. Question. I love this interview, sure. right? We having fun. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. How important is this show for you and for others battling addiction? Um, this is extremely close to my heart. Uh, we can only keep what we have by giving it away, right? Recovery. And uh, I'm really hoping, like you said, if just one other person, female or male, here sees this show and can at least see that there's hope. Like, I'm not bullshitting about my story. Like, you know that. We all know that. Like, I was I was in hell. I was, and a lot of it was self-imposed. But you, there's a way out. This show is, I feel like a lifesaver you know for those that watch it this is uh their hope shots you know thank you thank you so much thank you so much yeah that's, well, that's, that's, that's really why i created this show and for anybody out there right now i am mr show on tv and this is my channel it's the sober game podcast where we try to inspire others in addiction so if you are battling addiction right now from me from layla from all i guest speakers just please do not give up continue because the battle is not over it's only right. over when you let it be over. So continue to fight. Oh, Keep coming nothing. back. Keep coming back. <laughs> okay. What makes this you smile? And I like to smile, Miss Layla. I like that smile. <laughs> that, that, um, that's my next question. What makes you smile in recovery? <laughs> um, a lot of things. Oh, uh, God. Waking up and not wanting to die. Like, um, the connection I have found in the rooms. Um, because when you were asking about my childhood, right? I never, that's what I was starved of. It was connection to myself, connection to a family, connection to the world, a higher power. So what makes me smile um, is waking up and knowing that I have that today. And I don't have to do anything. They, these people don't want anything from me but to see me succeed and do better. Um, and I have found home. I never felt like I knew what home was until I got to the rooms and these people. So I smile because I know what home is today and I have a family. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Like I said, I'm rooting for you. I'm so much rooting for you right now. Thanks. I got another question. Um, okay. What does Layla have planned for the future? What What are your plans for the future? Ah, uh, that's a tricky one now because I try really hard to detach from the outcome and just do what God puts in front of me today. Right. My right. plans for the future are to 
understand my higher powers will more and to have the uh, courage to carry that out sharing my story is really important to me this was really this was a really neat opportunity and i thank you for that but those are my really only plans for the future are to stay clean um to share the message with other you know other addicts and other than that my higher powers got the rest and i am no longer i no longer feel the need to try to control the future because i can't <laughs> right, right. Hey, we, we go day by day that's it we live day yeah. by day we yeah, just for today. To, yeah, we never know what tomorrow is holds. So, you know, we just try to stay focused and positive and clean yeah. for that day. Yep. Okay, the last question. Out of okay. everything you went through, what has it taught you and what have you learned? Okay, just going to let that resonate for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Go right ahead. Um, I have everything I've been through. What have it taught uh, it's, you? What it taught me is that uh, I, I was... I was my worst abuser, um, that there's a way out though, and I didn't have to continue living like that. Uh, I have learned um, that the only limits to having hope are the ones you place on yourself, and that reaching out for help is is the greatest act of self-love you can do, and the, on like, the only way out of your emotions, because that's what we were all running from, right, is through them and learning to sit through them and you don't have to do it alone i personally don't think we can do it alone um i i owe so much to the rooms and these programs and my sponsor um i watched it's really quick i watched a ted talk in treatment that said the opposite of addiction is not sobriety it's connection you know because it's really really important to me yeah yes one of the best things possible because i'm gonna be honest with you too when i when i started this Layla, I done met so many great people. And I'm adding you to the list. Every okay, person, yeah, likewise. Every, <laughs> yeah, every person I interview, I gain knowledge from. We, we never too young or never too old to gain understanding and knowledge from other mm -hmm. people. So that Definitely is really not. why I created this channel. So people that like us, done been through hell and back, went through shit up and down in life, we can have a platform that we can come to share our stories and at the same time try to inspire somebody at the same time so that's i that's, think it's beautiful <laughs> that I'm, I'm very passionate about this i'm a, like i said i'm also enrolled in college i just made the, yeah i just made the dean's list Woo! <laughs> i'm starting i'm starting out pretty good i just started my own business and everything so god is blessed. i'm so proud of you as well then thank you so much thank you so much okay yeah. miss layla we gonna wrap it up I would okay. love for you if there anything, if there is somebody out there right now, Miss Layla, that is going through hell, woman, female, anybody, young, young person, um, what advice would you give them right now? Try to get to a treatment center, like or try to get to a meeting, try the rooms, like I, the 12 step program is the answer. It's relief from yourself, which will teach you how to get relief from whatever trauma you're going through. Um, give yourself a break, man. Give yourself a break. Maybe try treatment. Get us. Try the rooms. Try the program, man. It works. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, everybody, this is beautiful Miss Layla. Thank you again, Miss <laughs> Layla, for tuning in. Have a good day, guys. I love Thank you guys. You. Thank you. This is the Sober Game Podcast. Thank you, Miss Layla. Yeah. Thank you for having me. No problem. No problem. See you next time. Y'all, that was great. That was great. We had Miss Layla in the building today, everybody. Hey, you cannot make this up, everybody. But this is where we at. We are inspiring a lot of people in addiction. I've been through addiction myself. That's why I started this channel. That's why I'm so passionate about what I talk about. That's why I'm so passionate about having my guest speakers on here. We share our life story. We pour everything out. Real life stories from real people that have been through it. If you love this content right now, if you love these episodes, if you love what I just brought to the table right now, please subscribe to the channel. I will really love your subscription. We building an army of recovery warriors over here. This is a Sober Gang podcast. This is where we get everybody. Hey, thank you all because my videos lately has been doing very, very well. You know, um, with this recovery YouTube channel that I have, I probably will not be getting a lot of views like some of the other YouTube channels do because they're more 
you know, of the upscale model and entertaining and bashing and joking and playing. But you know, as long as I create, as long as I get this message out, that's what it's all about, everybody. It's about getting the message out. It's about communicating with others. It's about connecting with people all around the world and sharing the message of sobriety and recovery in a positive way. So thank you, Miss Layla, again for tuning in to the Sober Game Podcast. Thank you all for watching. This is Mr. Show Out TV. Till next time, like we always say, yeah. And we out. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Mr. Show Out TV Recovery and Addiction YouTube channel, where we hope to inspire those battling addiction. Please subscribe and like the channel. Make sure you click the notification bell to get notified whenever we broadcast. Thank you and enjoy the show. To support the channel, you can send donations to Cash App Dollar Mr. Show Out TV. So please don't wait, subscribe now. Together we can help and give inspiration to millions of people.